soon as I heard you, I, uh, um, I knew because, uh, and I mentioned this to you, I had a whole list of prerequisites as far as, you know, to be able to dart from character to character, to have the good audio quality, um, to have a, a, a voice that people want, are warm and friendly that you're going to want to listen to, which you do. And then there's a lot of little comedy in there that, you know, maybe people will find it funny, maybe they won't, but you have to have it delivered right or it doesn't stand a chance. And when I was listening to your record, I was going through the, the different auditions. And so John's like, oh, he's he's hitting all the points. He's this, he's this, he's this. And I realized that you were like 10 minutes in. I was not listening as an audit. I was just loved your voice. And I'm like, I said, you could have been talking about like air conditioning, <laughs> reading the instruction manual for how to work your air conditioner. And I would have followed it because, and I was like, okay, now I got to re rewind and listen again for you know, the thing, but it was just instant. I'm like, that's it. So, oh, well, it's nice of you to say, but tr trust me, it's in the writing. It's in the writing. <laughs> if it's not on the page, it won't make the stage. It's really is. It really is in the writing. It's just so wonderfully written and it was so much fun to do. Do you think there's ever been a time in this planet's history when we've needed escapism more than we do right now? Just something just to get away from reality. Because reality's pretty challenging for a lot of people right now. Well, there's a great new book called The Data Collectors. I say book, it's not a new book. The book's been out for a while. The audio version, the audio book is out. And I was honored to be chosen to be the narrator and producer of The Data Collectors audio book by Danielle Payi. And I got to speak to Danielle and she told me about how she got the book together, the amazing characters, where they all came from and the story and all that. And we got into Danielle's background and she surprised me with her childhood. I, I knew she was originally from Pennsylvania. She now lives in Florida, but I had no idea uh, the actual background she came from and the challenges she's had to meet in her life to move away from that and to move on and the thing she's been doing I mean we're talking theoretical physics yoga meditation and all the writing she's done for various people we didn't even touch on her radio and TV work she's an amazing lady she's a very brave lady even though in this chat she accuses me of being brave I'm not anywhere near as brave as she's been and she's written this terrific book the sequels gonna be out soon it's called The Data Collectors. You'll love it. Forget this world we live in. Go into Daniel Pai's world. And I was lucky enough to go into her world a little bit. For about an hour or so, we chatted about all things Daniel Pai and The Data Collectors. Congratulations on a terrific book. I mean, I'm a, I'm a fan now. Um, I, uh, I really enjoyed reading The Data Collectors. Where did the inspiration come from for this story? The characters, I think, hit me before the actual story did. And if I don't sound mental now, I will by the end of this interview. So <laughs> I can say that the initial inspiration was thanks to two cats. So one cat, Anna is now deceased, our Katrina, she used to look almost like she would show up and you, you I think you have cats I follow your yep, Twitter two cats where, yeah, they're like garden gnomes they're here and then they're here and then they're just looking at you and their eyes sometimes not moving going back and forth so I made the joke one time to my husband that you know what if they're actually their cameras in her eyes and they're just collecting information and sending it back someplace else and we're like making fun of her because she you know she'd come up to you like Meow, like she had something really serious to say and we would meow back at her and then she'd get annoyed Meow. <laughs> like, why don't you understand me, human? And and I said, you know what? She's probably trying to warn us that the world is coming to an end and we're making fun of her. So that was... <laughs> if you'd only listened, we could have exactly. a vaccine by now. <laughs> uh, probably. <laughs> so anyway, so that's where the, the inspiration, and I, I do happen to believe that uh, in climate change and that we are doing some bad things to our planet. So the idea is, what if we did occupy multiple planets on multiple universes but we screwed up in many places and now this is it um so 
hence the special interest groups in the story that either want to help us or uh, help us disappear faster. Yeah. So the second part was actually how um, Cepheus came to be, the character in the book, uh, was from our cat Bagheera, who I, I could not not put him in this book. He's in the book. Yeah, he plays himself in the book. He is himself. He, I mean, nobody could do him better, right? So, here's it. You ready for this story? Yeah. Um, basically, asleep at night, I hear a thump in the room, and I assume, you know, it's it's the cat. And I look over, and you ever have that where you're not quite asleep, not quite. You're in that lucid, in between state of being awake and being asleep. Have you ever did where you kind of see the room, but you're half asleep? So I see the shadow and I assume it's the cat. And I get up and I try to focus and then I realize like there's nothing there. But in my head, in my half asleep state, I'm seeing this vampire like figure with like a cloak over his head, kind of like cowering. And he's actually like a cat sitting on the on the tabletop. And I don't want to go to John and be like start nudging him like, wake up, wake up, wake up. I'm I I just told myself a story and scared myself, but I freaked myself out. So for the next hour, I'm pacing around the house like with this character of Cepheus going through my head um, because I managed to tell myself some really weird horror story. And then I thought, you know what? I need to get back to sleep. Uh, I have work tomorrow. So I'm like, what if he's a good character? He's just misunderstood. So then I started developing his backstory. And after I had his backstory, I was like, okay, he's a good guy. I fell back to sleep. So that's how. So it came from the characters first, and then the st- you didn't build a story and need characters to tell the story. You had the characters, and you needed a story to put them in. Kind of both. It was like back and forth. Yeah, a little bit. So some of it was writing, and uh, you have to understand this first book. This uh, this took five and a half years. The second book took six months. You've done the I second mean, one now. The second I, one's out as a. The second to, to one read? is, it is done. It is with test readers. I figure I've got probably about two two days worth of rewrites based on feedback and editing and then it'll come your way within probably three weeks at top i yeah. hope so i mean i'd love to do another audiobook with you because data collectors yeah. was so much fun the characters were well we'll talk about the characters later because for me i mean the story's good don't get me wrong but for me the yeah. characters made it and yeah. um probably because i had i had to get the characters right and i had to to, to, to bring them to life maybe i don't know but uh, we'll get to the characters in a bit, but I want to get I want to get your backstory. So, okay. <laughs> so you you grew up originally Pennsylvania. Yes. Tell me about that. What kind of a place? What kind of a town was it? Uh, not that interesting. It was Holland. <laughs> it was a small town. You drive from one end to the other, and you're out of the town. So, um, not much to tell. Suburban. Yeah. Uh, I've I've got a very limited knowledge of Pennsylvania. I've been to Philadelphia. Okay. I don't know how to break it to you, but that bell, there's a crack in it. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Um, and I've, that and I've, <laughs> yes, it's the amount of tourists that see that thing. You should work that out. And uh, I've been to Allentown. Okay. I think I've been to Allentown maybe once. So I lived uh, just north of Philadelphia. I actually did li- live in Northeast Philly for about six and a half years. So it's funny. I spent most of my life first trying to get out of the suburbs and lived in Philly and then in Manhattan. Um, and now I, I could live in rural and be completely content for the rest of my days. But Pennsylvania, there were some things I didn't appreciate. They had really nice seasons, and where we lived was actually right next to um, Tyler State Park. So when I was a kid, back then, you didn't have we didn't have cell phones. You basically went out, you rolled out, you were in the woods, and you spent your day like hiking and showed up for dinner by the time the, the sun went down, and that was it. You know, nobody cared where you were <laughs> as long as you got, as long as you came home for dinner. So I do miss that. Um, you know, it was like you could lay outside at night and you'd see like a million stars and like these bats flying all over. And I, I, I actually kind of miss that. I wanted to put a bat box up out here because I'm in Florida now, but John wouldn't have it. He's like, really? we're not putting a bat. Yeah, I would. So it was, it. it was a real rural beginning. That was, that was. It uh... was, it was suburbs it was suburbs but we just happened to be near the park so i actively sought out nature so i would say it was yeah not not as rural as as it, i would have preferred but you got, you, 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 you got into writing very early yes very yeah. young like yeah. s- seven years old you, you won a, a creative uh, writing award uh, yeah five years old i got you were my first five book. years old i still wow. have the pen 
that they gave me. And, <laughs> and what was what was the story? Bear, it was a bear in a bed. Yeah. So I actually happened to be homesick with I don't know what I had as a kid, um, and I had to. We had this creative writing contest, so I wrote about a sick bear in a bed, and then of course he gets better and goes about his day. Um, but yes, and they they wanted to put it in the library with the little pocket where you could sign it out. But my mom was like, no, this is her first book. I have to keep it forever. I don't know what happened to it, but yes. So. Well, you got you got published in the Writer's Journal when you were 15. Uh, yeah. You read my, <laughs> my bio. Of course my I book. did, because it's, I mean, it is <laughs> it packed. Cool. Your bio yeah. is packed. You have done so much. Yeah, yeah. so. I'm glad you think so. <laughs> you, no, you really have. Um, and it was, was it, the writing that took you to Manhattan, you mentioned you went to Manhattan, that was to study, wasn't it? It was, I, yes, I went there to NY. So basically, when I was a kid, you know, some people don't know what they want to be. I had two occupations from the time I was born. I was either going to be a writer or I was going to be a detective with supernatural powers. Okay. So um, the detective thing didn't work out as much, but I write about detectives with supernatural powers, so it kind of all meshed. So yes, I went when I went to NYU, though, my thought was almost um, music theater because I was very interested in singing and performing. And uh, But then I realized I don't like people actually looking at me. <laughs> so... <laughs> And I'm an introvert, <laughs> you know, like behind a computer is a little better, but on stage with all those people, I'm like, yeah, maybe this was a bad idea. But I ended up uh, going to NYU for communications, like mass media and global communications. So I was like, okay, I can probably do something with that. <laughs> so. And that and must I, have been exciting then as a young person, you know, New York oh, City. Oh my goodness. I, was, I had a very sheltered life. I don't know how much you want me to get into <laughs> my personal life, but very sheltered upbringing and then new york was just like oh my god <laughs> particularly in the greenwich village area where i ended up getting you know an apartment in like the lower east side and i'm like it, it's quite a shock in fact while i was living there that was uh late 90s i actually wrote the first three chapters of what was going to be my first cozy mystery and back then you had traditional press you don't have as much now back then there was a lot more and I submitted the first three chapters and I expected that it would get rejected and I would just keep reworking and learning the system and then sending it back. Well, I got an acceptance letter three weeks later, but I hadn't written the rest of the book. And <laughs> the me then panicked and I'm like, I missed my opportunity to, cause I just, nothing came to me. And even this book took a long time. So I figured now 20 something years later, I'm getting my do over. Right. Because in Australia, I lived in Australia for a while, and they have a really good expression there. You know, Australia is known as the lucky country because, yeah. you know, if you work hard, good things tend to happen to you. And they, they did for me. I got into radio in Australia. But they always say you should always bite off more than you can chew and then chew like buggery. I love that. <laughs> that that's... But, but when I interviewed you, we, when we spoke, you're braver than I was. I'm becoming brave in my old age, but I, but younger, I was not as brave. I mean, I had brave moments. Like when I moved to Florida, I didn't have a job, a place to live or any money. That's pretty brave. <laughs> but I <did. laughs> so I had brave moments, but uh, yes, at that moment, I, pro I could have, there are a million things I could have done, contacted the agency saying, when do you need the rest of the copy? Like something. You've got nothing to lose when you're younger. Yeah. Um when we get older and we've got responsibilities and you know mortgage and all the rest of it you do lose a lot of those freedoms and you can look yeah. back and go like why didn't I just you know I had nothing to lose was it had you started writing science fiction then no right um, so you were you were a a writer a creator a creative spirit rather than a, a sci-fi nerd then I was, yes. And actually, my most of my career from 2006 through now has been professional writing, press releases, blogs, um, website content, and it, very dry. And also, I've written a lot um, for metaphysical journals, for, for some mindfulness groups, so things related to like health and well-being. But fiction is one of those things that I started, always wanted to do it, and I would dabble with a short story here or there but I didn't flesh it out in fact this book was not supposed to happen I had a couple of other ideas in mind but the characters kept nagging me <laughs> and 
my husband is the sci-fi nerd. Right. Like, okay. He turned out on Star Trek and Star Wars until my eyes glaze over, and I woke up one day and I and it's always when I wake up from a dream. And I said, I'm not sure, but I think I'm having your dreams, honey, because I have and I'm telling him these ideas. He's like, you should write that down. I would read that. <laughs> and so you got into theoretical physics. What is theoretical physics? It's uh oh, you're asking tough questions. So don't <laughs> I want I want to know. I want to go deep. I want to find out cuz <laughs> no well, you wrote this wonderful book and I was honored to be chosen to to narrate it and produce it. And I just want to know where those ideas come from and I'm yeah. just trying to find the bits of the jigsaw to put it all together. Well, I'm glad you're asking this question. So I this screwed up my grade point average at NYU because I decided to take a, a physics class. And so I went from like a 4.0 to I don't remember, but it, it killed my grade point average because I thought it would be a fun elective. I don't know what I was thinking. So I'm not good at physics, but theoretical physics, I just like the idea. Uh, I like how it ties in with spirituality like I'm very interested in um, shamanism and when you compare shamanism in their upper middle and lower worlds to the idea in physics of like a multiverse and yeah. parallel universes there's a lot of of overlap so with theoretical physics it's you know uh, one of the first books I read was and I'm gonna slaughter his name Michio Kaku um, hyperspace and he was that was the first book I read where it talked about you know, wormholes and being able to go from one dimension to another and how time is not what we think it is. And um, yeah, so. So is theoretical own. physics kind of like legitimized science fiction? Because it's yeah. science. You That's know. a great way to describe it. <laughs> <laughs> right. OK. Well, you got uh, into I, the you got into the Eastern philosophy and Tai Chi and martial arts and all that yeah. kind of thing at the same time as theoretical physics. Yes. That and makes I, a lot of sense now. I'd be lying if I said I got a strong handle even now on any of it, but um, it was those what if questions that I loved. And I, I love that you're asking them. I wish I could give a more competent answer, <laughs> but um, yeah. So. And was it around then you started teaching yoga? I began teaching yoga, let me see, 2000, not long after. I started off in martial arts. And then when I moved into yoga, um, yeah, soon after. I actually le preferred yoga. I liked the meditation. I liked um, not coming home with bruises up and down my arms from sparring was always fun. But um, I learned how to uh, defend myself, which was good. So I feel I should let you in on a secret if you don't already know, because it might be change your line of questioning okay. when you're asking about martial arts and yoga and do you already know what it is no but i'm guessing it's <laughs> going to be good um so i grew up in a doomsday cult what's a doomsday cult then uh end of the world you're all going to die except for the few chosen who don't get to die okay yeah. so this is a jonestown kool-aid kind of thing uh not well, we weren't drinking any kool-aid we were just giving all our money to the church and basically you know whatever uh yeah so, so as, a, as a child, you grew up in that environment. Yeah. So I left wow. at 18 and a half. So when I went to New York, you so imagine going from little cult to Manhattan. Yeah, <laughs> which is a cult of its own. Oh, that's a multi-universe of cults. <laughs> yes, yes. So the whole martial arts thing, I was, um, I was done with any kind of religion, but yet I was fascinated by religion. So I, that kind of spurred me to study science and all the different belief systems to kind of figure out what I actually believed. So did you and have to, did you, did you have to break from your family? Cause they would have been like true believers if they were the thing you were a child, you were born into it. Like most yeah. people who, who have a faith are usually born into it. Um, yeah. So I was fortunate that half of the family, half of my immediate family had left and some were still in. Um, but it, it did its own ripping a part of the family anyway. I mean, you just can't go through that experience where um, things end up normal. So there is a part of that, you know, because, um, you know, when you grow up in that environment, you're told don't trust anybody outside the group. You know, don't share any personal information. They're, they're the outsiders. So then 
I'm going to Bible studies and things when other friends are going to like dances and dating and doing like fun stuff. So when I leave that, at, I was almost 19 at the time, I didn't have any of that experience. I didn't have the Halloween parties and the Christmas parties and the, the fun stuff that, that people got to do. So in, in a way, it was very isolating. You don't know anybody because yeah. you kept everybody out for so long. I had a couple of um, you know, good friends and ex, one of my, my best friends actually from when we were teenagers, I don't think she was even aware, like she knew I belonged to this weird religion, but that's all people knew. Like they didn't know the details of, you know. Um, so yeah, so now my, my cultimeter is very high. <laughs> right, but they were, they were based on a Christian faith, this, the, the cult. So they were based on, sort of, they called themselves Christian, but they were, and I, I hesitate to give the name because, um, yeah, sure, no, that's, that's fine. but um, they actually believed in the Old and New Testament. So we kept a lot of the Jewish holy days, but with their spin on it, you know, okay. where we would have the Day of Atonement, which was their Yom Kippur, where you don't uh, eat for 24 hours, or um, there were just some different there was kind of a mishmash of their interpretation of the entire Bible. Well, when Christianity came along, no. to be fair, it did the same thing. It took pagan holidays and changed the name. You know, Easter used to yeah. be something else and Christmas was a midwinter thing and whatever, which was quite clever marketing, really, because if you're trying to sell a religion and say to people, you know, we'd like you to follow this religion, the first thing, well, I don't want to give up my holidays. No, wait, you still get them. We've just rebranded them. You know, I think... <laughs> <laughs> so this is, you know, religion has been doing that for, for a long time. So it makes sense, you know, to, to use I, the I, same I, holidays. I catch flack for saying this, but when I, you know, as an adult going back and trying to read the Bible, I was like, wow, Jesus was such a great publicist <laughs> because he'd be like, he'd do this miracle and then be like, shh, don't tell anybody, you know, and then he'd go and do this other big miracle and be like, shh you know, and, and downplay it. I was like, wow, that's really good publicity. <laughs> yeah. So where is your faith now? I mean, you know, the the Eastern philosophies, I'm guessing, you know, Hindu, Buddhism, the really old ones, which are much older than Christianity, have got, they've got different things to them which are, are different to, but there's similarities in some of them. Um, yeah. So wh where is your faith now then? I am there. There's not one that I can say this is the it, yeah. but I would say it's kind of a so hybrid. You're not, you're not an ist of any kind. <laughs> not an ist of any kind. Um, but if I had to claim, there's kind of three that overlap. Um, probably Buddhism. Just I feel very comfortable going to a Buddhist temple and listening to a talk and doing a meditation. Um, new thought spirituality. I like the idea of co-creating. Their whole idea of you don't pray to a god you're nothing and you give your power away it's like you create with the god kind of kind of right. a, an attitude and i love um shamanism just the whole idea of having different worlds and being and that kind of ties with that idea of being able to create your reality and your universe and working with spirit guides because when i meditate i get information all the time which makes me sound crazy um, you know, in a voice that sounds suspiciously like my own, but do you ever have an inner voice tell you and you just know you have to follow it? Um, so yeah. I do think that there are guides. Yeah. Um, my, both my parents have passed. Every once in a while I hear my mom check in, and it's usually something sarcastic and funny as hell. <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, I think the only thing that lets that down is the people who charge money to talk to dead relatives. I think that's a bit of a scam. But, would you? Uh, why would you say that, though? If, if uh, you know, I'm, I'm not judging, but, you know, somebody is good or bad, but why do you think it's a scam if, if say, you don't yourself tap in? Like, I would always tell people if they ask me a question, because people have come to me and said, what's your, your gut on something and, and have asked for my insight. So... I think, first of all, first of all, they're charging money for a okay. start. So that raises a bit of a red flag for me. Also, I think that, I mean, I, I've had them on my radio show. Twice I've had people, uh, I had one lady told us she brought the Queen Mother through. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. And from meeting them, I got the feeling that those two particular people were crooks. And mm -hmm. so I, I formed an opinion pretty quickly about 
you know, that kind of type of show business, which is what I think they're in. And I also thought that if I had a relative visit me from beyond, from the other side, I don't think they'd want to play a guessing game with me. I think they'd tell me straight stuff. But instead of all this, oh, I'm getting a thing and I'm feeling a this and I'm seeing a blue color and I'm, and then making you fill in the blank. I'm sure if the relative returned, they would say something straight away to let me know. Yeah, this definitely is them. Yeah, it I don't depends. know. I don't think they'd be so vague. I don't know why there's I don't I can't see any reason why they would be so vague. Yeah. So I hear what you're saying. Um and I'm not saying that there aren't a lot of crooks. And I and I personally don't think that there's a problem with charging. It's almost like you can cook your own dinner or you can pay somebody to give it to you. So if you're okay. not doing the work. So to be intuitive and to, and to have that connection with people who have passed, for some people it's easy. For some people it's a lot of meditation and a lot of work. So if you're not doing the work, it would kind of make sense that somebody outside who is would pick up on stuff that you might miss. So I get that. Um, the vagueness is, uh, at least for me, when I talk to people, sometimes weird images will come up and I have no idea what it means. Like, I'll be like, what the heck is the elephant and whatever? And usually they'll be like, oh, well, I just came back from this trip to such and such and I was writing it out. Like, usually they're filling in something, but I don't know why it's important, right? So if I get a, something for somebody and I say, hey, I got this weird thing, I don't know what it means, can I share? That's for you to figure out. That's not for me to like to to tell you. And I know so. So people come through you that you don't know at all, but they are connected to people that you're with. Um, as well, because you said your mom comes through and and stuff. Yeah, yeah. like yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. I don't, just, occasionally, I'll see like uh, somebody's energy coming through, and I don't necessarily like. I might be talking to somebody, and I'll be like. I don't know, but there, it seems like he's like this 40 something year old man on this side. He seems like he might be a, a uncle or I don't know who he is, but he's saying this and then it'll be some goof. There is always that thing of, um, am I making, is this just my imagination? Cause I'm a writer. Am I making this crap up? Right. And then I was like, I don't know if, if I mean anything, but they'll say something so bizarre that makes no sense to me at all. And I'll say, can I share something with you? And I'll share. And usually they're like, it's something important to them. And they know exactly what I, whatever they have, I have no idea what that is. Right. So. Right. Wow. So do you think I'm, I'm a total whack now? <laughs> Not at all. I think everybody's entitled to the freedom to believe whatever yeah. they, they want. You know, I happen to believe, you know, that Liverpool Football Club are the greatest football team ever and not everybody agrees with me, but I'm allowed to believe that. And I don't see why people shouldn't have the freedom to believe whatever they want because for all we know, they're right. Because <laughs> nobody knows. Yeah. So why and you, sh I, why I you should, you know. Exploiting, exploiting people. So I, you know, I, um, it's very funny because, and I sometimes do it for fun where, you know, when I was younger, I would you go to a carnival and some gypsy is all dressed up, all funky, and she's going to tell you your future. And then she wants you to pay all this money to break this curse. And I'm sitting there and, and I'm not a psychic. I consider myself intuitive. Like I, I, I tend to think of psychic ability as a combination of observation, experience and intuition. Right. So I can guess somebody's expression maybe because. I know what that means when other people make that expression or they're maybe talking a certain way and I'm like, okay, I've met enough people with that personality to figure out what probably happened. So I don't think it's all one thing. It's a hybrid, but I always think it's funny. Um, in those cases, they're going to, you know, break the curse and that, and that's exploiting. Now you're taking advantage of somebody who's really trying to, to make a breakthrough of some sort in their life. And I'm sitting there and I'm seeing like there's, this wedding photo behind this woman, I'm like, oh, she's divorced. She doesn't know how she's going to pay her rent. She's worried about this. And she's looking at my clothes. She's going to tell me I'm a businesswoman, which she did. <laughs> she's going to tell me all this other stuff, which she did. And I was like thinking, maybe I should be reading her. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. So you could do the reverse reading. Let, no, no, let me tell you some stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So I leave it open um, because I do coaching for people. And sometimes people want meditation. Some people want just regular. Um, I mean, meditation I love. 
I love meditation. And uh, I, I always joke to, to Julie, who my wife, she, she does yoga now and again. And I always say to her, you know, one of the greatest things about meditation is, you know, the old joke is it's better than sitting around doing nothing because it is sitting around doing nothing. And I always think that yoga spoils it because now they've put exercise next to it. And exercise, <laughs> they've, yeah. they've, you know, but I'm talking well, to I'm, a yoga instructor here, so I know I'm on very thin ice. No, but, no, you're fine. <laughs> um, well, I look at, at the yoga as the, the breath synchronized movement. So that is is more mindfulness, less meditation. I mean, yeah, you could look I at see. it as the same way as Tai Chi is moving meditation, but that's more just being mindful, whereas the meditation is the mindfulness um, with all the other parts. So, for example, um, when you meditate, do you um, focus on some one thing like just your breath? The, uh, just the breath. So, sometimes I use a mantra if I'm in the mood, but usually I just focus right. on the breath. Yeah. So you have um, a few different types. And to me, I have my personal that I think is the most effective for me. But you have your open monitoring where you just observe and you let whatever thoughts float around because it's amazing what goes on in your subconscious when you're, you don't realize the self-talk and the things that you yeah. kind of marinate on. So you have your open monitoring and then the mantra or the breath would kind of be that single focus where you're letting those other, you know, thoughts kind of go. And then you have your guided imagery where people are, might be saying, or guided imagery or somebody might be saying like a Buddhist meditation, like, may you be happy, may you be healthy, and you like send out loving energy. So it's very um, directed. Yeah. So to me, whenever I teach any of those, I always want to come back to not only the breath, but you get to that, and I don't know if you've experienced that no mind state where you're not focused yeah. on your breath, you're not, you're just in this zone. Yeah, what, what I found it, I found it particularly useful when I did breakfast radio. I used to <laughs> get up in very early in the morning and I used to meditate directly before I went on the air. Uh, I'd turn out the lights in the studio and, uh, and, and meditate before I went on the air. And I found it was like, you know, if you've got a computer that's like really busy and it's doing stuff and whatever, and you, they defrag it or something, they, 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 yeah. they, someone can go in there and like clean it out. So it's, yeah. it's all the, all those extra programs and all the stuff <laughs> that's been downloaded off the internet that you didn't even know. And it's all cleaned out and then the computer works better and faster. I yeah. found it was like that for me because, and it meant that, you know, I could then focus on, cause I did at BBC Wiltshire, I did an all speech show and there was a lot of guests and there was a lot of research and some of them were political interviews with, with politicians. Um, you know, we had the leader of the opposition on, we had, you know, Westminster politicians as well as the local council people. And so you needed to be pretty sharp. And, and if you've got lots of distractions or lots of buzz and other things going on in your head, you can't do the best interview. And a lot of them were very, well, especially when we had uh, politicians from Westminster, you got a slot with them down a line. So you couldn't even see their face. And you had like six or seven minutes with them. And you'd have a really important topic and you had to get to the point and get to the good question or set them up so you could knock them down you really you couldn't you couldn't mess about you, you know, I mean we're having a lovely chat now and anything we think we can go down to but you had to stay on it and I found that meditating directly before I went on the air focused my mind really really well and, and took a lot of that other those other busy programs that shut them down or cleaned them out does that make sense absolutely and yeah. and Hey, if you do that every day for a period of time, you might have some relatives show up. <laughs> <laughs> no, but then, oh, I went on, I went on weird, weird trips during it. Um, you know, often I would be orbiting a planet. You know, like the like the Star Child in two thousand and one. You know, I'd be, be really well, out. There. Are we talking about are we talking ayahuasca trips or just meditation <laughs> Medi no meditation no 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 nothing nothing I should, I should specify that well i like shamanism no hallucin hallucinogens <laughs> at yeah. least for me <laughs> yeah wow so yeah this uh this really is this this really is uh is going deep isn't it right and, and now now i can see that now in the data collectors in the book just all of those influences because it seemed like you know, because I, I do a lot of audio books. Well, I don't do a lot. I mean, I've done since You've done May. A ton. <laughs> I've done twenty six since May. That's wow. how many I've done. And awesome. 
I've done a, I've done one other science fiction one, which was a lot of fun. Was a time travel one, so it was multi dimensional. Um, but I've auditioned for a lot because every morning I audition for books, and I found that some of the science fiction books, they're Shakespeare. And yours isn't like that. Yours is. I'm no, I'm not Shakespeare. No, but a lot of them you could see it was about it was about warring races and yeah. uh, and you know and it was you could see it had to be done in a, and I hadn't and I didn't get any of those editions but yeah your one was uh it was fun it was it was so much fun even though there were so many dark moments in it too you know um, I thought it makes sense because of your personality because you're the entertainer the broadcaster you like connecting with people and I think the story works because it's much more about human relationships than it is even about what's going on behind the scenes in my opinion i just think that at least i love my characters so i if you love the characters um because you just the diversity of your voices i don't know if you realize how hard that is to like jump from that many different characters this is a huge list and wait till book two comes oh my god <laughs> There, there's about a dozen more. <laughs> that's that's the most fun thing about about doing audiobooks, though, is the is the characters. And I've done a lot of business books, and they're fun too. And I learn a lot from them. I've, I've just done one about marketing, uh, which was really interesting. And I've yeah. I've stolen a few things from it for yeah. for for audiobooks uh, and stuff. But the characters, and but they were so. The characters in your book are so real. I mean, we're talking like lizards and stuff you know but 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 real and um well, they were nagging me i mean it it took so long because i had all the other work that i was doing you know i i had my my birdland business and everything else so this was like on the side nights and weekends things that i would do um but the characters kept they wouldn't leave me alone it's like until the book's done and then when the book's done it's like okay well you got two more <laughs> so well let's talk about the characters now then so Lucine, is she she based on you? I think. Okay, I'm not as. Uh, you wait till you see in book two. She gets worse uh, before she gets better. Um, yeah, I can relate to. I can relate to all of them in some way. But Lucine and Fatima and Isabella, yeah, they kind of feel like the most variations of myself. I mean, Odessa, the mermaid. You'll yeah. find. Well, she doesn't like to be described as a mermaid, though. That's remember? True. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. she's. Got a little bit of an attitude, but yes. So I would say Lucine, um, I can relate to her, particularly in my younger years. You know, I eat healthy now. She eats like crap, but you don't. But she seems to re retain her health and well-being. Yeah. Um, I should watch my mouth. I keep saying crap. <laughs> I have a potty mouth. <laughs> so I gotta, well, it could be I much worse, Danielle. <laughs> So, yeah, so her little bit of um, like the social anxiety that comes out with her, I don't have it to the extreme, but I definitely could see that. I mean, coming from a cult, um, you know, social interactions, I feel always felt like I was socially like 10 years behind everybody else. So it took a while to like kind of catch up. And I still feel a little bit like even this conversation makes me a little bit nervous. I'm not like, you know, ready to go hide under the bed with Bagheera until it's all over. But um, with her, because she has the sense of that somebody's out to get her, you know, so I could draw on my past. So, yes, I would say she's reminiscent of me younger, but obviously more extreme because the character started off too normal. And I think. I figured to make them interesting, I had to kind of mess with them because otherwise they have no place to go. They're just static throughout the story. Uh -huh. So yeah, there has to be some growth. <laughs> yeah. Um, Cepheus, we mentioned. Uh, yeah. Tanager. Yeah. Where did he come from? Uh, well, his name actually came from something else. Uh, uh, I'll get to that in a second. But <laughs> I just needed, he's somebody I just needed a counterpoint to Lucene. Uh, and I tried to think what kind of person would be the complete opposite of somebody who, you know, cusses too much, eats all the wrong food, doesn't trust anybody, kind of, you know, is is working beneath her skill set in a job where, you know, hiding, you know, and can't stand opening red doors. And I'm like, what's the complete opposite? So, of course, this, this 
well-spoken intellectual professor who's very polite and does everything the right way to the point of always taking his hat off because he thinks that's what he should be doing on earth so. he's almost he's got a childlike innocence that makes him very endearing oh it's good no he <laughs> has i like him <laughs> uh but uh and you find out a little more of his backstory in book two and, and okay. why that is so yeah. and he actually I think of all the characters might be the one that at least right now is the most normal and got it together. Um, so he kind of, and, and other than Ivan, which has his own eccentricities, yeah. which we'll get to him. Yeah. But Tanager, the, the whole reason for the name is I have not made too many trips abroad, but I did end up in the Amazon jungle, which is another story. <laughs> but, and I ended up in uh, the Chino village and I met the shaman who was a woman, which I thought was so fascinating. People always think of shamans as men, but uh, Pashkita was the woman. And she and there were some things going on in my personal life. Long story short, uh, it was a time in my life where I had just ended a relationship. We were living together and a contract ended. So I had no job, no place to live, no relationship. Life pretty much sucked. And then a friend, a friend of mine happened to be going on this trip to Peru and uh, at this lodge. And she's like, do you want to come? And I'm like seeing this burning city behind me, this image. And I'm like, OK. And I pretty much put it on a credit card, had no idea how I was going to like pay the trip back after I got done. And so I ended up there. So I go to see the shaman and she's speaking this ancient Spanish. And so the guide is like translating. And she said, She's, she doesn't under, she's trying to figure out why you're so sad. And of course, because I was all broken hearted. And she said, because I see you as this black and red tanager bird that goes, this independent bird that goes around happy and singing all the time. That's your natural state, which is funny because I do go around pretty much happy and singing all the time. So, so she, and then she kind of figured it out and, um, she had said to me, well, I'm going to raise your heart fire so other people see your value. And what I really think she was saying is I'm going to raise your confidence so that you can be present so that other people can see, you know, what you have to offer in the world. And then he and then he says to me the next day, he didn't tell me that day. The next day, the guide said, oh, and she says, you're going to have a husband now. <laughs> Now, and I do find it funny that it was Spanish because my husband's Latino and that was not planned. But I was like, well, she didn't specify what culture. And so how from. long between that and meeting him? Um, well, I had I had met him before, but we had we were not a, a couple. So it was somebody that I had met him what, in 2006. But her I met it was 2008. So he, uh, he and I didn't get together finally, which is another story till 2010. And yeah, we got married 2011. I didn't get married until I was 38. Yeah. I wanted to make sure I was good and ready. For yeah. Him. <laughs> yeah. Which yeah. is different. You and your wife, I saw you had your anniversary. You guys have been together like how many decades? 30 something years now? 30, 30 years, yeah. Uh, Julie was Julie was 19 and I was 23 when we got married. Yeah, youngins. Yeah. yeah. But hey, it worked. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> yeah. It did. It, it, it's worked, it's worked great. To, to figure that out and get that out of the way in the early 20s and, and not have to go through, you know, the, the Hallmark <laughs> scenarios. Yeah, I think we were very lucky and we had a really nice meeting story. I think having a nice meeting story is, is important. We met at a wedding. So, yeah. Yeah. So what about you? Where did you meet him? I met him on um, an online dating site. Really? Actually. And really? nobody likes to say that. Everybody we meet, we have so many friends that met on a dating site. Well, let's put it this way. We're both two introverts who spend a lot of time behind books and computers. <laughs> you know, you got to do something. The odds right? the odds are in its favor. <laughs> right. Yeah. If you can look at the profiles, like I'm a busy person. If I can look at the profile and say, you know, see the deal breakers right away. Oh, smoker, drugs. What does that mean? No baggage, no drama queens. What is he? I, I don't understand. Ooh, people that. put that on there. Yeah. They'll put no drugs, no gold diggers, no drama queens. Um, all kinds of or they'll say, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. And I'm like, well, what are you offering? <laughs> <laughs> we know what you don't want. <laughs> so, yeah. Back okay, to I'll the back to the characters then. Drake, yeah, yeah. where's he from? Is this because of your experience Every in Manhattan? relationship melded together into one. Because <laughs> he's horrible. Yeah, he's he's pretty horrible. Um, 
yeah, related to people that I've I've worked with, known, possibly dated briefly in my younger years. He's hey, what, kind of narcissists and thousand. sociopaths. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I didn't say that. And okay, it's okay. He's not real. You made him up, Danielle. You're not. You're not defaming Drake. He's not real. He's a. He's a figment of your imagination. No, I he's don't re- want to report all the people I've oh, ever I dated. Oh, I see. I see. Right. Okay. But that's okay. Some yeah. of them were very nice. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, and that was quite a twist in the church as well. I didn't see that coming. Uh, okay. That was. Well, I'm- Thing initially that people thought he could potentially be good like I, I didn't want to give it away too soon like I'm giving it away now but it, it's not a big a, a big thing but I, I initially thought well you, you know is, is he going to be the potential love interest or is he going to be like I wanted there to be kind of a we don't know what's going to happen but he's just um, he's just slithery he's yeah. just a slithery person yeah he's an opportunist I think um yeah he's uh i've worked for him many times <laughs> he runs so a lot you, of so he, some of the characters are are just you know a, a conscious creation um like ivan who uh, i don't know i'm not really sure why i decided to make him kind of viking-esque although um i think john could pull off a viking suit he's got by like, kind of the beard and the scruffy you, you mentioned so. this last time we talked that there's a yeah. lot of there's a lot of him in ivan ivan's yeah. by the way I, my my favorite character yeah he's everybody's favorite character so far um so you know and, and ivan is the german word for john so i thought people were going to get it right away when they read it so the only person that has read the book and said oh it's john was john's dad he he got right away who Ivan was. He's like, oh, like she, he thought it was cool. I wrote his son in the book, but um, and obviously it's a character. It's not like him, but it, entirely. But he very much is the tinkerer. He built his own motorcycle, like with all the parts and creative design. Now he wants to do like build a recumbent bikes for people, and so he's always has that inventor mind. Um, he he's a contractor and does computer storage and virtualization and things. In fact, when I wrote about this, the the vessel, I said to him, "Can you read this and just tell me if it's possible? And if it doesn't make sense, what do I need to adjust so that it does make sense?" <laughs> so he was kind of my technical direction to make sure because uh, the the beauty of having something that's not exactly this Earth and not exactly this time is you can fudge a little. You don't have to be a physicist, but I wanted it to have just enough possibility, kind of like theoretical physics, where you can think, hmm, maybe. So. Mm. I know. I, well, when I when I read it and it said, I think the only clue was it said Viking. Yeah. And so I thought, well, I could make him like a Norseman, but I don't, I don't see modern Scandinavians as Viking esque anymore. <laughs> I don't know what happened up there, but you know, they were these barbarian hordes up there. You know that they that tried to you know they conquered like northern Europe, yeah. but now you meet Scandinavians and they're the most the nicest, friendliest, most placid together people you could think yeah. of. So I wasn't going to go that way, and then I thought, well, he's got to be northern, and it's you know. So I made him Scottish. <laughs> it worked, and I I didn't want to specify for anybody. Um, because I didn't want it to be like okay, this is an African accent, this is a French accent. Like I wanted to have it vague enough, but give give you the idea that I wanted the voices to have some differences in some character without feeling like you had to do that particular accent. But hey, it worked. So. Oh, he so he was so much fun, so much I fun. I thought he and Cepheus, um, in my head, they seemed like they would be, and and even Mark and I, in to a certain extent, there were certain ones I could hear him in my head, and I think that they would be quite challenging, um, to do. To so do which, well as as an audio book. Yeah, I think No, th- the I ones th- the ones that are challenging are the ones that are the plainest. You give me someone who's there's not much and I'm like, I don't know what to do with this. But when you say, Oh, he's a tinkerer and he's into this and he you know, then okay, right, okay, I know the kind of person and you read more on, I read ahead and all the rest. They're the they're the, the most fun ones and the almost the easiest ones to do. Because um, yeah, you can be over the top and you can play. Yeah. Yeah. It's when they're very, uh, when there's really not much to them. That's when they're the more difficult. I think I, I think I told you the last time we chatted that I find the hardest voices to do are the Americans, because they tend to be the the most 
the boring, the not no, too I'm not much. Saying, I'm not saying boring, <laughs> but, you know, when you think of like a, a, a Scotsman or, or any nationality, really, and also with Americans, I'm aware that because, you know, people are bombarded by U.S. culture on TV and, and in movies that, you know, if I got the accent wrong, people would know really quickly. And I would sound like Dick Van Dyke sounds to British people when he's in Mary Poppins. Because we don't know what that accent is. But it is not a Cockney chimney sweep. But we don't know what that is. Because, you know, and I'm always worried about about making that mistake. So yeah. so I was very comfortable so with the Scotsman. Female characters that were American. So you got a double whammy with trying Yeah, to but I, obviously I got away with it because you didn't. You did. <laughs> and you did great. <laughs> and... Um, even the the, the lesson that the the people with smaller parts in the book, like Fredo, uh, I had so much fun with, because he was a huge lizard, but he's a bodyguard. So I, I thought he maybe uh, have a military background, and and in this country, uh, the military officers come from the upper classes, but most of the military from uh, the lower ranks are are more working class people so i made him yorkshire that was that was why i went with uh with that for and once him. you hear more of the backstory of the royals in book two that makes total sense so good choice oh good and, good and the royals i the royals i did as as almost as caricatures oh, of the, uh, what is the tv show um it's not what is it called we watched it was about the royal family recently the comedy and i'm forgetting the name so you're not uh, talking Windsors. about Okay, right, yeah. Did you, I don't know if you've seen it. No. Uh, but the two main characters, when you were doing Sabrina and Hamish, that's exactly what I thought of. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, they were fun. Um, and Morph and I was another one that came up. Uh, like, Cepheus was the cat. Morph and I was another one of the lucid dreaming. And he, he was freaky. Um, yeah. I, was, I, I mean, was any shapeshifter is hard to get a hold of because, you know, you know, one minute they're... Uh, they're they're an ocean dwelling animal. The next minute they're a butterfly. You know that's. Well, I didn't, and he was not um, a part of the story. He just decided to be a part of the story again. I told you I would sound wacky. Um, when some of the characters show up, when I'm half asleep, I'm like, okay, you're going in. You're going in. I'm not done yet, so you're going in. So with him, I actually saw this blue crocheted face head coming out of the floor as I'm half asleep. Freaked myself out again. Didn't want to wake up my husband, but I'm like, okay, this is the second time after Cepheus. So I actually half asleep said to this character, you know, well, are you like Cepheus? Are you a good character? And he got this monotone answer. Well, that depends on who you talk to. <laughs> I was like, yeah, that's, pull the him. Covers that's him all over, though. That's that made <laughs> him. Yeah. Because uh, you don't know whether he, you know, you kind of don't know whether he's good or evil. He's, he's, uh, he also get you get more book two is kind of it's it's a lot faster a lot more uh a lot more of the backstory and and none of it on earth so i think it's it's much more interesting so oh really so the yeah. data collectors are not on earth collecting data in the second uh, one they are in book one in second book no okay is this, oh i no. see is the second one still called data collectors then it is the data collectors book two is breach of contract and so the third one is uh data collectors between the layers which you uh you won't know what that means until you read the second book right and is odessa in it or is she still on earth because you she... have a thing for odessa <laughs> well i Ju <laughs> julie would julie would say to me julie would say to me at the end of the day how was your day today and i'd say well you know for a little while i was a topless mermaid <laughs> 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 you know and she'd go what and so now well she's you know she's not a mermaid by the way but you know there is a scene where you know who's she talking to and he says can you just bob down a little bit you're um <laughs> you're, you, you're very distracting um and julie's like no and i'm like yeah this book's fun you know yeah. and um yeah. She has an integral part in book two, you'll be happy to know. And by the way, that is very hard for me to write. Even the romance was hard for me to write because, I, 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 you know, in fact, the test readers came back the first time around and they said, are Lucine and Tanager supposed to be interested in each other? Because I'm not like, um, you know, I feel like I need to know more of what she's thinking, what he's thinking, because I don't get it. Mm -hmm. And and I was thinking, I was so subtle, I'm like, this explains my dating life <laughs> where you like somebody and you think you're being so stinking obvious and they're like Whoosh. and it's like oh 
she's not obvious enough. Okay, how can I make this more obvious? But it's very weird for me to write. Um, in fact, even the boys at the beginning were not cursing. And one of the test readers said, I have two tenure, you know, I have two boys that were cursing like sailors at age 10. So they, in, if they saw this blue head coming out of the water, there is no way they're going to be that polite. Right. <laughs> so so right. I had to, to rough them up a little bit. And that is actually hard for me, even though I have, you know, my potty mouth. It was hard for me to write that way. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. So you start you you started out with the characters and a bit of the story based on what the cats did. You put it together. So how many test readers do you use? Um, the first one I did, I used two. And, and actually, you made a good point about the construction of this book, which I, I want to tell you after, uh, if, if you have time. No, absolutely. So I had two, re two test readers. Um, and then this one, I have three readers. And the, the third reader is a sci-fi fan. But I asked him, don't read book one, start with book two. Let me know if I have enough flashback and enough where it doesn't hit you over the head with it, but you can pick it up. And so far, you know, I think he's uh, nearly done. He had no trouble following the plot without having read book one. So that was important to me. So, yeah, so this one I have three. And then I do the rights. And I actually am an editor, but it's never a good idea to self-edit because your brain is automatically going to correct what you've written. So I always send it to somebody else. I have a, a professional editor, a proofer, and then I will go through, like I read this three times and made changes and edits uh, <laughs> because that's just me. But yeah, uh, all that before it actually went to print and, and came to you. Well, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And it took a little while to come out and I don't know why ACX spent so long with it before it came out. Uh, I had a... I I, I was had, so excited. You got it done in like a record time. It was amazing. And I'm like, wow, it'll be out by, you know, my birthday. And then my, and then like a month later, I'm like, where is it? And you know what? I, I actually did send them an email and I said, hey, it's been over 30 days. I know you guys say on their site that they're backlogged. Um, they said due to the high volume, it might take 30 days. And they sent me a polite message right away saying, you know, we're going as fast as we can. I guess with COVID, people are stuck inside. They're all writing books and producing, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing. But after I sent that letter, two days later, it went through. So I'm wondering if maybe... Oh, ah, okay. Because I did it... I like to do them as quick as I can because I don't yeah. want to stay away from them too long. I want the memory of the last chapter or four chapters back still to be quite fresh so that I'm, yeah. I've got that in mind. Because if you go, if you do that and then you go away and because I work on, I'm work on multiple, I usually work on five books at a time. I'm working on four wow. at the moment and I do like a couple of hours on each in a session and, and go back to them. And I can usually get, if someone, if someone you know, the way that ACX works is you put a 15 minute check in and I usually try to get them after the 15 minute check to get them done, allowing two days for every finished hour. So if a book is six hours long, I like to have it finished in 12 days wow. uh, from the 15 minutes. And that kind of suits me. And I've done that with, well inside that for most, well, for all of the books I've done. And then I wait, I, I had them... And then, like, I think it was last week or the week before, they put, like, six or seven out, like, on the same day. So wow. I don't, and they, but they'd been, like, weeks apart. I don't I know why. I actually went to their website, and I'm like, you know, as a freelancer, and I'm like, okay, you guys are really backlogged. Do you need people to listen to the audio for you? Because I know a girl who could do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That'd because be a nice job, too, listening to stories. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Especially as a writer, you could steal ideas. No, no, I would never do that. No, no, Actually, you'd never make it obvious. You would take inspiration. I wouldn't make, you no, know. Oh, no. <laughs> the reason why, even though I coach people and, and I'm a trained coach, I would not want to coach. I would be a book coach for somebody writing nonfiction, but I would not want to do fiction for that very reason. Because I don't want somebody to come back i've heard too many horror stories months later saying oh your book here was my idea we talked about it when you know we were coaching yeah. and, and unfortunately that kind of stuff happens a lot so i would honestly i would probably avoid it for that reason but i see right yeah I'd probably stick with nonfiction or thing or genre that i'm not i wouldn't write although so, i didn't really think i was doing sci-fi so <laughs> who knows so the writing yeah. really is is the fun part because you because I know you ghostwrite blogs and you do and some articles and things for people. So this to me, I spent you know the the last what since two thousand six really when it took off um, 
writing short pieces, you know, feature articles and things that you can write in one sitting or two sittings if you have to do some research. I just thought it was like a recipe. You just triple it and you have your book. <laughs> and I had no idea. So I tried with this one. It took so long because I thought I need to have, like I read the how to write, you know, and got all these writing books on how to write your book in 30 days. I probably should have sought guidance at that time. Um, and so I, I tried to outline and I'd get stuck. And I'm like, well, I can't start writing the book until I have the outline and I know from start to finish what's gonna happen. And then I would try to get all the characters and their backstories and the settings and how they talked and all the stuff you're supposed to do to write a book. And obviously that wasn't working for me. And we were, we started off talking about meditation. I sat and meditated, I'm like, for probably an hour. And I'm like, I'm not moving until I get some clarity on what to do with this book. And the message that I got in my head was, why do you have to write it in order? And why do you have to know what's gonna happen? Just sit down and write whatever scene comes to you at that moment. So for the next month, I would sit down and I would write whatever scene came to me and then after I started, it was almost like a puzzle, putting all the different pieces back together. And, and there was a lot of rewrites, because I'm like, okay, well, I revealed this information here, but in this chapter, I said this. So there were some uh, plot holes that I really had to, to fix and go back. And so there was a lot more rewrites than there'll be with this one. But it was written all out of order. And then it was putting it together and the characters ended up doing things that I they weren't supposed to. Um, Roman was supposed to be completely different than what he turned out to be. <laughs> what was because he was actually quite nice. I I liked him. He was a yeah. and he was a good he guy. What he he was originally without giving too much away. He was what he thought he was in the original version. Oh really? Oh and it okay. So three quarters of the way through, I'm like, oh, so that's his issue. <laughs> Because I was worried about him, you know, the the scene in the bar and everything. I thought, Ooh, I don't know, but then he turns out he's cool. Yeah, he's a really nice guy. Well, yeah, and he's got some interesting things happening in book two. So, so many of the characters turned out to be um, quite a bit different than what I had started off thinking they were going to be. They evolved so, as you wrote them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I, I, you know, I I had him very clearly defined, and then all of a sudden his story changed and the story, but it needed to. I'm like, okay, that makes sense then. So I kind of let the characters take <laughs> control of some of the some of the scenes. So. Yeah, well, oh, it's terrific. So you were an award-winning writer when you were age five. Um, award-winning. <laughs> you've, you've, I have the, the little pins. Yeah, that you've, been an, you, you've been an award-winning <laughs> writer since age five. You've studied martial arts, meditation, you teach yoga. You've even done a bit of TV and radio work as well. I do. I am actually on a podcast now. Um, one of the, the people that I contract with, they work with um, different retirement communities throughout the U.S., so some 80-something at, uh, at one time. Um, so working with older adults in just uh, in healthy longevity. So out of that came the Doc Roger and Friends. That's a podcast I'm doing now. So it's Doc Roger is a preventive medicine physician. He has this, he was a full colonel in the military, such cool stories, such an awesome person. So he's like the host. And then um, Teresa and I are the co-host and she herself is a, is a life coach. And so I kind of was brought in to be the more the spiritual side because what they what they talk about in in with their the company masterpiece living is they talk about the the keys to healthy longevity like being spiritually connected socially connected intellectually stimulated keep learning um and just keep being social so and physically active so we kind of are bringing that into a larger audience outside of their their team so anyway that was long-winded, but that is the podcast I'm doing right now. I've had two others in the past, uh, one for Birdland Media Works, my company, and then Discernment Radio with uh, my colleague Cindy, who you met, because we had done a series of mindfulness and business courses together, or at least a couple of them. And, and I, honestly, we had a few more in mind, but she herself is an entrepreneur doing all this, and I'm doing all this. So every once in a while, we come together and do a project together and then kind of do our own thing and then regroup to talk about it. So, and I have a wow. lot of, a, a number of female friends that 
it's so funny. I, I seem to connect with a lot of uh, uh, entrepreneurs of women who have their own business in different arenas. And it's always fun to to even have like a Zoom call just to see what the other person is working on because you always then get new ideas. Yeah, so. yeah. So for someone who says they're not that brave and haven't taken that many risks, <laughs> you've really packed it in. You really I have. If I can be behind the computer and, uh, and the Doc Roger, I edit it, right? So if I say something dumb or if I, you know, one of the first things I had to learn because in yoga, and I don't teach anymore. I do teach meditation. I don't teach yoga anymore, but there's the ujjayi breathing. So if you're familiar, breathing into the back of the throat. So it, it almost sounds like a, a person snoring if you do it too strongly. So I naturally start breathing that way without thinking about it. And so the first time I did the interviews with people, I hear myself <laughs> in like the microphone breathing and swallowing. I'm like, oh, that's awful. I have to take all that out. So I'm, and hopefully I didn't do this on your interview, but Not I have to all. remember, take a, take a breath through your mouth instead of your nose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I uh, I had a, when I was at, I'll just say a quick story, you've just reminded me of, when I was at BBC Wiltshire, I had the, the head of the, the two, the, the two heads of the political party, we have the Labour Party and the Conservative are the two main parties here, and I had the, the head of the local council who was a Labour and the head of the Conservative, head, there was a Conservative and the Labour leaders, uh, local councils, this is local politics. And I knew that the conservative leader actually hated the Labour leader. He didn't just dislike him. He hated yeah. him. Hated him. <laughs> so I got the two of them together live and they're, you know, they're behind the mic each. And I also knew that Gary, the conservative, when he got angry, he would go very quiet but breathe very loudly the more angry he got. <laughs> And the thing that made him the most angry was hearing hearing the Labour bloke talk. So I, I had the Labour guy, I forget his name now, it was Gary was the Conservative guy, but I said to the Labour guy, I said, so tell me more about this, whatever, and he just started talking. And Gary, I said, Gary, I said, no, please, Gary, let him finish, which wound <laughs> Gary up even more. And I said, no, tell me more about this. And I got the Labour guy to talk more and more and more to wind Gary up. And Gary's breathing got louder and louder and louder. And I turned his mic up as far as it would go so you could hear the breathing. <laughs> and it just Ooh, worked. You're a little evil in it, it worked brilliantly because people listening would be going like, listen to Gary's breathing. You know, it's just <laughs> even louder. So you can, can I just say I'm glad you're on my side? <laughs> because I suspect you have the potential for evilness. <laughs> <laughs> but I use my powers for the forces of good and not for evil. Yeah, that's what I say. I try to use my powers for good. <laughs> and my current radio show is recorded. It's recorded in here, actually, so it's yeah. not even live, so I can't do that. But it is that the current radio show is a, is a podcast chart, and I have podcasters on as guests, so that we sh our next chat, we should just talk about the podcast, and I, oh, can, yeah. and I can run that audio on the radio show. And, um oh, yeah. Because it's po it's a radio station. It's quite a new station. It started out in London, but now it's on the air in London and Manchester and Glasgow. So it's okay. on the air, and obviously it's online everywhere else, and it's a podcast as well. And it's called... The, the, they came to me and they said they wanted me to do a, um, a chart countdown show of podcasts. And I said to Jerry, who was a terrific bloke, he's the boss, I said, Jerry, that's great, but... I hate chart countdown shows. I don't care <laughs> if something's gone down six big places this week. I'm real. It's just nonsense to me. So I said, can I have guests? And he went, yeah, sure. So now it's a cleverly disguised show full of guests. Yeah. And they're all podcasters, which means the guests have been easy to get because everybody's got a podcast. I know. I know. And and is that, I would love to do that. And I, I didn't think we were, you know, we're not super famous. So I don't know that we'd make a countdown, but... Um, would it just be me, or do you want the other two? Let's get everybody on. on. Let's let's organize it. To give me some right. dates when you can get everybody on. We'll do it like this, but we'll do it like the last chat we had, where there was a few of us on, and you can yeah. tell me all about the podcast, and I'll lift the audio off. I'll put the whole thing on YouTube, but I'll lift the audio off and and put it in because you know the the chart show, the chart I use, the Pod Twenty, the Pod Podcast Radio Pod Twenty is loosely based on an amalgam of the British and American podcast charts. But if I've got a guest on, well, their podcast tends to end up in the chart. <laughs> ah, 
Oh, I would I would love to do that as soon as I as soon as we're done, I'm calling them on the phone. But guess Please what? do that because I've had some lovely guests on. I had Alan Alda on. He talked about his I, podcast. I watched that. I love that. Yeah. I well, that's I that's. Watched, that... I haven't I w- haven't watched it yet, but you did an interview with John Cleese that I have it on my list. I want to go back and and watch because yeah. I really like. Yeah. Well, that one too. that one's only a recording. That one. I, I went to his office okay. in Chelsea. That was before. I, this is when I was doing. Um, I was doing yeah. a podcast called London Calling. It was for. Yeah. It was about Americans and Brits, and and so that's just audio only, but it's about an hour oh. long, yeah. Uh, yeah, I went back to that one. The Alan Alda, are, uh, that was fun. I watched that one before yeah. you actually, before I interviewed you last time. So uh, he was long. lovely. He was lovely. Yeah. So you've got to you've got to come on that show as well. But I it, would love to. In the meantime, the audio book it's out now. It's been out yes. since late <laughs> last week. It's called The Data Collectors. It is fabulous. It's not like any science fiction I've ever read before. It's not like a Shakespearean version of warring tribes and all the rest of it. But there is conflict in it, and there is some very interesting characters in it, and some some very very deep stuff, and some politics too. And you should get it now from well, it's on iTunes, it's on Audible, it's on Amazon, and it's all there. If you like reading it, get the read version. If you like listening, then I'll read it to you. <laughs> I recommend the audio version. <laughs> you have the you have a great voice. I I'm honored that you did the the book. I'm I'm, I'm honored to be chosen the because because for the, you know the work that must have gone into it and you've you've touched the surface of of what was involved to then hand that over to someone you don't even know and go hey turn this in it was like wow this is quite a responsibility so thank you and very much instant, as soon as I heard you I. I uh, um, I knew because, uh, and I mentioned this to you, I had a whole list of prerequisites as far as, you know, to be able to dart from character to character, to have the good audio quality, um, to have a, a, a voice that people want, are warm and friendly that you're going to want to listen to, which you do. And then there's a lot of little comedy in there that, you know, maybe people will find it funny, maybe they won't, but you have to have it delivered right or it doesn't stand a chance. And when I was listening to your record, I was going through the, the different auditions. And so John's like, oh, he's he's hitting all the points. He's this, he's this, he's this. And I realized that you were like 10 minutes in. I was not listening as an audit. I was just loved your voice. And I'm like, I said, you could have been talking about like air conditioning, <laughs> reading me an instruction manual for how to work your air conditioner. And I would have followed it because, and I was like, okay, now I got to re- rewind and listen again for you know, the thing, but it was just instant. I'm like, that's it. So, oh, well, it's nice of you to say, but tr- trust me, it's in the writing. It's in the writing. <laughs> if it's not on the page, it won't make the stage. It really is. It really is in the writing. It's just so wonderfully written and it was so much fun to do. Danielle, thank you so much. Thank you.